Hello, this is William from Visual Components. In this video, I'm going to show you how to create a simple background plugin for a Visual Components 3D product. For example, I'm going to show you how to print feedback to the output panel, create a new component in the 3D world, select that component, and edit the camera of the 3D world using .NET API. Now, if you're new to the .NET framework, you can go to the MSDN network to learn more about it. You can go to our forum at forum.visualcomponents.com to ask questions. You can refer to our SDK packages to learn more about the .NET API and how it's used with our software. And if you want a link to the project and plugin we're going to make in this video tutorial, just check the video description. Before we get started, make sure you have Visual Studio installed on your machine, as well as at least Visual Components Essentials. Now in this video tutorial, I'm going to be using Visual Components Premium. So are you ready? All right, let's get started. The first thing you want to do is run Visual Studio as an administrator. So go to my Windows toolbar and I'll do a search of Visual Studio. And there's the program, so I'll right click and then click Run as Administrator. The next step is to create a new class library project. So on the start page you can click New Project or you can go to the File menu, Point to New, and then click Project. But you see you have a shortcut there of Control plus Shift plus N. And the type of project you want to create is a class library, which I have selected here. Notice I'm using .NET Framework 4.5 and the language is Visual C Sharp. Let's go ahead and rename the project. So I'll just type this as example 001. I'll click OK. And now Visual Studio will create the project for me, which you can see listed here in the Solution Explorer pane. Let's now add the references to this project we need for our plugin. So I'll right click References, click Add Reference. And in the Reference Manager, you need to click Assemblies because we need one component from the .NET Framework. That's called system.componentmodel.composition. This deals mainly with the MEF, which I won't talk too much about this in the video, but I will in later videos. I'll then click Browse, and you can go to your program files of your Visual Components project and find these three libraries here. So we have Calibre Micro. This is a third-party library we use, so I'll select this checkbox here. And then we have the .NET API for Visual Components called create3d.shared and ux.shared. Now once again, you can find these three by going to Program Files, Visual Components, and then it's the name of your product. So in this case I'm using Premium. So I'll click OK and there are the references. Let's now add using statements for those references we added to our code. So in my class I'll create some white space here. Let's then add a using statement for system.componentmodel.composition. Let's then add a using statement for Calibre Micro. Let's then add a using statement for that Visual Components .NET API. So Visual Components dot create 3D and visual components dot UX dot shared like so. Now in order for our class to be recognized as a plugin we need to uh, implement an interface called iPlugin. So for the class name we'll then add a colon and it needs to derive from iPlugin and we now need to implement this interface explicitly so I'll just point at it and use the light bulb and then click Implement Interface Explicity. Notice it has two methods, so we have iPlugin.exit. This is when the plugin is closed, so we won't worry about that in this video tutorial, so I'll just clear out that code, but you could comment it. And then Initialize, this is when the plugin is first started up, so we need to define something here. And what do we want our plugin to do? Well, we want it to print feedback to the output panel first. So to do that, we're going to use an interface called iMessageService. So to get a handle for that, Let's first define the type, so it's iMessage service. I'll name my property, uh, I'm sorry, my variable ms. And now we're going to use an IOC, so this stands for inversion of control. So instead of using the MEF, we're using IOC. And you're able to do this by using this Calburn micro library. And now let's use the get method. So we're going to get an instance of an object, which is of type iMessage service, like so. And now we'll use this service to print a message. So I'll do ms.append message. So this will add a message. And it takes two parameters. So first one is the message we want to print. So we want to print hello world. Then we need to find the message level. So I'll use that constant. And I'll just indicate it as a warning. Now in order for our plugin to be used, we need to export it as a certain type of object that the software can recognize. So in this case, we're going to add an extra view tag. So before the class name, I'll use square brackets, type export, two parentheses, and now I'm going to use that constructor of type of, 
to add it as a type, and the type, you may have guessed it, we need to export our plugin as an I plugin. So I plugin. So in one case we use the IOC to get an instance of an object and then use that to print a message and then we export our plugin as a type of I plugin using that export tag in the MEF. We're now ready to build and test our plugin so I'll go to the project menu here and access the properties of my project called example 001 and now in order for our assembly this library to be discovered by the application our software we need to add a UX prefix to the assembly name. So that's capital U, capital X, dot, followed by your assembly name. And let's now go to our build properties. And our platform target, it's a 64-bit software, so I'll target for x64. And we want to build our assembly in the program files of our products. So in this case, Visual Components Premium. But this might be Visual Components Essentials in your case. So just go to your program files and select that folder for your product. So I'm going to be building my assembly in Visual Components Premium 4.0 folder here. So I'll select that folder. So now go to debug and I'm going to be testing the plugin with the software as I go. So I'll select set start external program and we now need to go back to our Visual Components program files and find the executable for the product. And it should be listed as Visual Components.engine.exe. So this is the executable file click open. And now let's go ahead and save everything, go back to our code, and then I'll click start to start debugging the plugin. So it'll first build my solution, and then it will start up the software. And now the application is running, and we can see in the output panel, yep, our plugin worked, it printed hello world to the output panel. So we created a simple plugin that has no user interface, but it is running in the background. Let's now add more functionality to our plugin to have a default scene we want in the 3D world. For example, when you start the application, you may want to have a component already in the 3D world and selected for you. So to do that, let's go back to Visual Studio and stop debugging. And now let's create a new, a new component with one feature and a property in our code. Now to do that, we're going to need to use the application object of the software. So to get a handle for that, you could either use a constructor for the class or you could use uh, a lazy installation and use the MEF to import that type of object you need. So I'll show you how to do the MEF way. So I'll add an import attribute here. And we're going to import this into a private variable or field. And we only need the application object uh, when we start to use it. So I'm going to use a type of uh, initialization called lazy. So this right here. And we're going to initialize something of I application type. And I'll just call my variable app and set it equal to null. So then when we go to initialize our plugin, we'll get a handle for the app and the 3D world itself, which is a type of I sim world. And I'll just type name my variable sim underscore world equals, and we're going to do app, and since it's using lazy installation, uh, initialization, sorry, it's a tricky word, it's going to be app.value, which is the value of that object, and then we're going to say dot, let's see, and it's then this property called world. So notice it returns an ISIM world type object. And after we get the 3D world, we then want to create a new component in it. And a component is a type of ISIM component. And I'll name my variable comp equals sim underscore world. And I'm going to use a method called create component. And this takes one parameter for its first overload. So let's say the component name is example. And now after we create the component, we want to have some geometry shown in the 3D world. So let's use a block, which is a type of I block feature. I'll name my variable block equals, and I'm going to use my component object. And we now need to work in the node of the component. It's root node, so I'll type the property of root node. And in that node, we need to get a handle for the root feature to add more features to it. So after we get the handle for the root node, I'll now type in dot root feature. And this feature allows me to then create more features. So in the root feature, I'm going to use a method called create feature of a certain type. And the type we need to create, you may have guessed it, is I block feature, like so. And now for this block, we may want to change its geometry or have uh, some properties we can edit in the, in the component properties panel for it. So let's now create a new property in the component. So it's going to be I property. 
And what type of property will it be? It will be a double. So a real type value. And I'll just type the name of it to be block underscore length equals comp dot, and I'm going to use that method called create property. And what I'm doing here is I'm adding a new component property. And now we first need to find the type of property we want to create. So I'm going to use that constructor again of type of to create a new generic type of double. And then we need to find the constraints. So I'll use that constant of property constraint type. And for right now, we don't need any constraints to limit the value of the property. So I'll say not specified. Then we can define the property name. So I'm going to call it block length with no space. And there's our property. It seems we've got some error here, so let's see what that is. All right, so probably should add some parentheses somewhere. And nope, that didn't work. Ah, yes, I'm sorry, I forgot. I need to cast this property as uh, a type of double property, so I need to add that cast there. So either before or after the instructions, so I property dot double, like so. And yep, now the error message goes away. So what we're doing here is we're creating a new property in the component that's a double type property or a real property. And then we're having no constraints on it, and this is the name of that property. What we want to do now is assign this property to control the length of the block feature we created here. So let's add that instruction. So let's say block dot pro We actually need to get the property, sorry. So the block has a length property, a width property, and a height property. So for get property, I'll type in the name, which I already know is called length. And then once we have a handle for that, we'll use its value property to assign it a value, and since this value is a type of string or an expression, we can just directly assign it that property and we created in the component to control it. So I'm just going to type in here the string name of that variable we, we of that property we created in the component called block length. And now after we do that, we may change uh, or ha actually have a value for that block length property. So let's define that now. So let's say block length dot value. And by default, the block length, width, and height is 100 units or millimeters. So let's actually make it 500. And since we're updating the length of the block, let's go ahead and update the component or rebuild its geometry. So I'll say comp.rebuild. Use that method there. So to explain, we first got a handle for the application and then a handle for the 3D world itself. We then created a new component, added one block feature to that component, created a component property, and then assigned it a value and then use that property to control the property of our block feature. And then we rebuild the component. So let's see how this all works. I'll start debugging again. This will rebuild my plugin. And yep, here we go. We can see our message printed. And there's a block with a different length in the 3D world. But notice we actually have to zoom in to see the block. So what we can do is we can edit the camera of the 3D world to automatically fill our view with everything in the, in the scene, in the 3D world. So to do that, let's go back to Visual Studio and stop debugging. And let's now get a handle for the camera of the 3D world. So that's going to be of type I camera. And I'll use a variable name of cam equals. And in this case, you need to get a handle for the active window of the software, not the 3D world. So we're going to use that application object again. So dot value active window. You can see here it's of type I window. And after we get the active window, Notice it has a property called camera, which is of type I camera, and that's what we need here. So I camera. And now that we have a handle for the camera, let's go ahead and use a method called fill world to fill our view of everything in the 3D world. So if we now debug again, rebuild our plugin, and what we expect to happen is it will still print that message. We'll see the new component with a different length and it'll be zoomed in and fill our view with it. All right, so it prints the message. Here's the new component with the block with a different length. And notice it's now clearly in our view. We don't have to zoom in. But notice it did not select the component for us. So what we can do is we can tell our plugin to automatically select that new component. Let's actually go back to Visual Studio and write that code. So let's stop debugging. And now after we edit the camera, 
We're now going to use a selection manager to get a handle for how we can select objects in the 3D world. So that interface you need to have is called I Selection Manager, and you can get that from the 3D world object you have. So that's I Selection Manager, and I'll just call that SM equals, and now we're going to use our Sim World object again, and then we'll use the Selection Manager. Actually, I'm sorry. This is a uh, uh, you can get that from the application object, not the 3D world. Sorry. So we're going to use app dot value once again dot selection manager. So there's the property for the application. And notice it's subtype i selection manager. And once we have a handle for that, we'll do sm dot set selection that method. And we just need to tell it what to select. So the object we're going to pass it is our component that we created, that variable of comp. Let's start debugging again. So it'll rebuild our plugin. And there you go. So we have our message. Here's the new component, which is selected for us in the 3D world. And here are its properties. So what we can do now is test that property we created called block length and see if it changes the length of the block. So let's actually type in 100, press enter. And yep, notice it's now using that uh, property update to change the length of the block. So let's type in 1000. And then let's actually set it back to be 500. Now the last thing I want to show you is how to import parts for your plugin at the time of its creation. To do that, let's go back to Visual Studio. I'll stop debugging. Notice I was using lazy initialization to get a handle for the application object when I first needed it, which was when I was initializing the plugin. An alternative way to do that is to use the constructor for my plugin to import the parts I need. To do that, we actually don't need this import attribute anymore, so I'll comment it out and then we can get rid of this lazy initialization, but we still need to define the type for this variable, app. And now let's define the class's constructor. Let's actually rename the class to something more meaningful than class one. So I'll just right click and click rename, and let's rename it to my scene. Press enter, and we actually should probably do this from the solution explorer. So right click the class item, and then click rename, and let's define it as my scene. And then Visual Studio will take care of the rest for me. And now let's add that constructor. So public my scene, parentheses. And we need to import the part we need. So we'll add an import attribute. And we're going to import a type of I application for our first parameter, which is of type I application. And we'll just name that parameter app. We'll now add the curly braces or brackets. And we need to signal to the MEF that this constructor for our plugin can import parts. So let's we need to add an attribute to the constructor called importing constructor. And then let's get a, that variable in this plugin, this.app, equals the instance of the application imported by the constructor, like so. Now, since we're no longer using lazy initialization, we do have to clean up our code a bit. So notice here, in the, when we're initializing the 3D world, we no longer need this value property for the app. So it just becomes app.world. And then when we get the camera, it just becomes app.activewindow.camera. And then when we get the selection manager, it just becomes app.selectionManager. And the reason why I'm showing you this is that when if you're going to refactor your code or make some changes, just remember that there is a difference between how you uh, define the objects and get their attributes and their members when you're using lazy initialization as compared to just importing the part you need in your constructor. So let's now test our solution. I'll start debugging, and then it's going to rebuild everything and open up the software. And we can see that everything still works. Now, if you have any questions about the .NET framework or the MEF, you can go to the MSDN network and read more about it there. You can go to our forum at forum.visualcomponents.com to ask questions. You can refer to our SDK packages for examples of how to use our .NET API with the software. And if you have any questions about this project or plugin I created in this video tutorial, there are links to the files in the video description. But until then, I hope you have a wonderful day.